Okay, welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, and we're going to continue our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through the book of First Peter. Um, I apologize, first off, let me say, for uh, going a couple weeks without uh, doing a First Peter. Um, usually I try to get ahead several weeks, and I thought I was ahead, and then I realized, man, I am so far behind. <laughs> it's been amazing just how quickly things are passing by. So I apologize that I haven't... Um, put up a first Peter for a couple weeks, but uh, I'm going to try to get several done and be able to keep doing that. And today we're going to start in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Last time we went from verse 1 all the way down to verse 11. And we got to remember that the context is marriage. And Peter is talking here about how a man should act and how a woman should act in the marriage relationship. When two become one, and they're one flesh. And according to Peter, it's like this. Well, he tells us that the wives are to be in subjection and obey their husbands. Verse 1. And uh, then he goes on and talks about how a woman shouldn't overdress or underdress, if you will, in verse 3. They should be conscious of how they look. And if you're a godly woman that really loves the Lord, you shouldn't be trying to show yourself off shouldn't be trying to pass yourself off as, as a trendy or, or trying to uh, draw attention to yourself. The Bible says when you're married, your husband's body belongs to you. And if you're the husband, then her body belongs to you. And that's the way that God set it up in the marriage relationship. And then he continues there as he's going down. He's talking to the women and from verse 1 all the way down to verse 6. Then in verse 7, he starts in on the men. He says, now you men, you need to do this, this, and this. Give honor to the wife as the weaker vessel. And then he says that your prayers be not hindered. If you're a man and you're mean to your wife, the Bible says that God will hinder your prayers. He won't answer your prayers. So the way that God deals with you as a man, if you're married, is he's watching you and he's saying, now is he nice to his wife? Because if you, he sees some anger or bitterness or hatred in, in, in your heart for your wife, then God goes, oh, you want to treat her like that? Watch how I treat you. Hmm. That scares me. That scares me. I want to be good to my wife. I don't want my prayers hindered. And I want God to be happy with me. Amen. Not angry. Not upset. I, I want to make sure that I'm doing what I should be doing as a Christian and pleasing God. Well, as we continue, I'm trying to get the lighting here good. I guess it's the best I can get. So, so as we continue here, uh, he's talking there. And then in uh, verse 8... It's like he's telling both of them, this is what you need to be like. So he starts off, women, this is for you. Men, this is for you. Then he says, now this is for both of you. Now, what's interesting is how we see the context is clearly in marriage. So 8, 9, 10, 11 is all in, in the marriage relationship. But there's a lot of times in the Bible where you can take a passage and you can say, now this doesn't just apply to a man and a woman that are married. This applies to everybody who's saved. So look at verse 8. He says, finally, be ye all of one mind. So not just man and woman that are married, but all Christians, we should all have the same mind. We should all make sure that we all believe the same thing and teach the same thing. Well, the best way to have the same mind is to have the same Bible. That's why I'm King James only. God gave us the King James Bible. I do not believe in or use or accept new versions of the Bible. Now, that's cost me some friends over the years, and if so, well, that's, that's a shame. But I've looked at all the new versions of the Bible. They come from a different line of text. They come from the corrupt Catholic critical text, which take out uh, words, which take out whole verses, which have historical errors, have mistakes in them. I don't want a Bible that's not pure. I believe in the King James Bible because it comes from the right text, and there's no errors or mistakes in the King James Bible. Now, some people say, yes, there is. I don't believe that. Every one that, that I've ever been pointed out, someone said, this is an error in the King James Bible. I look at it and go, no, I don't see that. God always shows me that, no, that's not, that's not an error. That's not a mistake. So I don't believe in any other version. I'm King James only. So I'm one mind with other King James Bible believers, or I should be. Unfortunately, there's people out there that claim to be King James Bible believers like me, but yet there's something that they don't believe, the same as I do. And because of that, quite often they want to divide. They want to cause division. And then what happens? Well, then they want to argue. Now, one thing, if you know me, I've got over a thousand videos on YouTube. So hopefully you've, you know me a little bit if you've watched all my videos. 
I do not want to argue. I don't believe in starting an argument, causing an argument, or continuing in arguing. I don't want to be an arguer. I don't think it, it does anything good for us. Uh, my dad always used to say, you cannot reason with unreasonable men. And there are people out there that are unreasonable. I get emails all the time. People say, Brother Breaker, so-and-so attacked you. Watch their video. And I'm like, I don't, no, I don't even need to know. The Bible says, leave off contention before it be meddled with. These people want to stir up strife and contention and do things that are evil and say bad things about other Christians. Bye-bye. You go do your thing. I'll go do mine. And I want to edify. That's what the Bible teaches. We're supposed to edify one another. So verse 8 all the way down to 11 is not just in the marriage relationship, although that is the context. We can take that for ourselves. And look what it says in verse 8, 9, 10, and 11. And I think every Christian should remember this and read this. Because oftentimes you have people that claim to be Christians and Bible believers, and they're not of the same mind. I, I, I thought about this this week, and I don't know if I should talk about this, but the Lord really showed me something this week. And uh, I don't know how I could say it without exposing the person I'm talking about, so maybe I shouldn't say it. <laughs> but... Uh, this week, I, I really, I, I see how many people think. Let's put it this way. Other King James Bible believers, they think like this. I want to get along with other Christians. I want us to all have the same mind. I want to have fellowship. So because of that, I'm going to make sure that I don't preach on this, this, or this, or this. Because I know that this is something that other people might not believe. So I'm going to make sure that I just compromise and I won't say anything about those things. Well, I think that's a problem. I think we should never compromise as Christians. There should never be something that we don't preach because we don't want someone to... to, to. If God tells us to preach it, we preach it. Now, I don't intentionally, on purpose, preach something to hurt people. But if someone is sinning, and someone is in sin and doing something wrong... And God tells me to preach what the Bible says about that sin. I have no choice but to preach on that. If that person becomes offended, it's not my fault. It's their fault because, number one, they sinned. And if they're angry, they're angry at God and what he said right here in this book and not at me. So I go out of my way to not try to harm, not try to hurt people on purpose and talk bad about other people. I don't want that. I don't want to do that because, well, that's not what it says here in these verses for me to do. But the, with that said, there are some things that I believe that other Christians don't. And I believe it because it's in the Bible. And I won't back down on it. I won't change what I believe. I won't say, well, if you don't believe that, then I won't believe it either. Because you don't. No, I'm going to encourage you, no, believe it. Because it's in the Bible. Now, I won't give you any examples or anything like that. But I've come across some people that claim to be Christians that don't have the same mind as other Christians. And it's almost like when you meet another Christian, it's almost like there's this barrier there. And it's like, okay, is he like me? Is he just want to argue, or is he a real Bible believer? Does he believe what the Bible says, and, and, or is he just looking at me as an opportunity to start fighting with? <laughs> Does that make sense? I met other Christians, it's like that. You don't know them very well, so you're kind of standoffish, because you don't know... Are they a brother in Christ that loves God and loves the Bible and wants to, as the Bible says, have one mind, unite in the belief of the truth? Are they someone that's, like the Bible says, just wants to render evil for evil and railing for railing and wants to attack and ridicule and name call and put others down? So when you first meet someone who claims to be a Christian, there's this, there's this kind of uneasy feeling of, all right, are you the kind of Christian that follows the Bible? Or are you the kind of Christian that's just wanting to attack? And it's an interesting and a strange thing because the Bible tells us that we're to unite as Christians. We're to be of the same mind. And yet, God is a God of division. You can't go to the Bible without reading. First chapter, in the beginning, God divided the, the darkness from the light. And God divided this, and God divided that, and God divided... So there are divisions. Divisions are necessary. Matter of fact, one of the things you're supposed to do as a Christian is rightly divide. 2 Timothy 2.15 The Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You're supposed to divide that book. So what does that mean? That means you say, okay, what are the divisions that God put in that book? Oh, Old Testament, New Testament. 
Okay, Old Testament's over. We're in the New Testament. Now, what's in the New Testament? Well, early book of Acts, to Jews, to the kingdom, trying to get them to accept their Messiah. Well, they rejected him. Okay, now Paul. Oh, but then after Paul, after the rapture, well, then it's back to Jews. Then it's tribulation. Then at the end of that, when the Antichrist rules, then at the end, uh, Armageddon, Jesus comes back and sets up the Millennial Kingdom. So dispensations are probably the best way to study the Bible. And I learned something today that kind of bothered me. I learned that there was another uh, brother in Christ that I kind of looked up to that I thought was a great Christian that doesn't believe in dispensations. And so that kind of bothered me, because I want so bad to unite with other Christians and be of the same mind, as that says here in verse 8, be ye all of one mind. But if they don't believe what the Bible teaches, and they're not rightly dividing, then how can I be their friend, and how can we have the same mind when they're not believing in how to rightly divide? Do you, does that make sense? And no doubt, you've probably come across people like that, too. Matter of fact, as most of you know... Um, I get a lot of emails, and the rest of the week I'm so busy that uh, I just take all day Monday to check my emails, and usually it takes all day. Sometimes I have so many emails that I have to do a Tuesday uh, email day, too. But Monday, most pastors take off on Mondays to go play golf or something like that. I don't. Monday is the day that I work the hardest. I'm sitting there looking at all these emails. And the majority of emails that I get are from people that are hurt in a church by a pastor who has changed from preaching something that was right to something that's wrong. And rather than trying to be all of the same mind, as the Bible says, he's trying to tell them, now you have to change what you believe to come over here to me. Well, they're like, no, the Bible says this, and you're the ones that changed your mind. How do we? And a lot of people, they, they end up having to leave their church because their pastor has fallen into apostasy. And that's a horrible, horrible, horrible thing. And I don't want that. I want Christians to unite and be together of the same mind. I don't want them to, to be splitting up all the time. And yet, that's the world we live in. Splintered communities. Splintered churches. Splintered Christians. The body of Christ is just splintered. And Christians are all over the world, but they're just, oh, here, and one there, one here. And you don't know where they are. They're not coming to church like they used to. And it's sad because a lot of churches aren't preaching what they should. And if that's all it was, well then, okay, yeah, that's not too bad. But the worst part is then they start talking about each other behind their backs. And that's what I see, and that's what hurts me, and that's what I have decided that in my life and in my ministry, and as a Christian, one thing I don't want to do is gossip about other Christians, talk bad about other Christians, put them down, say things about them. So I don't want to name names. And so I try not to do that because I want to follow this passage of Scripture. So today we're going to start in verse 12, but let me rack up in verse 8 because I think this needs to be repeated. And we looked at this last time, but I'll read verse 8 all the way down to 11, then we'll start in verse 12. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. So we should try as Christians to all believe the same thing. And yet, there are people out there who claim to be Christians, and it seems like they just can't get along because they always want to find something, some little doctrine that they want to fight each other over. And that's so sad. But what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to have compassion. We're supposed to love other Christians. So I have a lot of grace. I have friends that don't believe what I do on everything. But they're saved. They believe the gospel. And I can put up with the fact that they don't believe in certain little things that I like to call the non-essential doctrines of the Bible. You know, little things that just don't matter. And so it's like, okay, well, you don't believe that? That's fine. Do you believe in the blood of Christ? Yes. Are you saved? Yes. Do you believe pre trib rapture? Yes. Okay. Do you believe King James Bible? Yes. Okay, we're buddies. <laughs> if there's something, little thing that you believe that's a little different than what I believe, we still have the same mind in the fact that we're uniting on the right things. Little doctrines, you can go off on the deep end. You can go off to an extreme on getting some little thing in your head, well, if no one believes like I do on this one point, then they'll never be my friend. And it's some dumb little thing like, like uh, who's the twelfth apostle, or some silly, you know, just I just made that up. But something like that, it, it's called a pet peeve. And a lot of Christians, they get their own little pet peeve, and they make their little pet peeve doctrine. And then they say, now, my basis of fellowship of following me is whether or not you believe this one thing like I do. 
And unless you believe that one little thing that I believe, then you're a heretic and you can never be a true Bible believer like me. <laughs> that to me is really sad because that shows someone's full of pride in their heart. That shows someone has no compassion, no love for the brethren. It says be courteous. Usually such people, all they want to do is argue and debate with somebody uh, and try to convince them that, that, that they're right and the other person's wrong. Well, that's not courteous and that's not pitiful. Now, what is pitiful? Well, we think of pitiful today. We think, oh, somebody's pitiful. That means they're horrible. No, pitiful here means full of pity. Take pity on people. What does that mean? Well, it means you feel sorry for them. There's a lot of people out there that claim to be Christians. And I look at them and I just feel so sorry for them. I don't know why they do and say the things they say. I feel so sorry for them. So the Bible tells us to, to be courteous, pitiful, and love, and have compassion. Verse 9, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing. But yet many people today claim to be Christians and that's all they do. They attack other Christians. And those Christians, they don't know how to have charity. They don't know how to be long-suffering. They don't know how to tolerate and put up with and ignore their attacks. So they attack back. And then you got to fight. And then railing for railing. One's yelling at the other. Nah, 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 nah. And what's sad to me is the lost world sees that and they go, Ha! Huh, all Christians do is just yell at each other. Ha! Huh, I don't want to be a Christian. Now what happened? These Christians have made a lost person want to be lost. Want to go to hell. If that's a Christian, I don't want to be one, I've heard people say before. And it's a shame. What's the problem? Rebellious Christians who are not following the scriptures, the scriptures say clearly here to love, to be pitiful, to have compassion, to be courteous, and not render evil for evil. And look at what it says in verse 9. But contrary wise, contrary means don't be like that, be like this. Okay, Peter, be like what? Blessing. Knowing that you're there unto called that you should inherit a blessing. So we're supposed to bless each other. We're supposed to love one another. Verse 10, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Alright, I'm a Christian. I'm a born again child of God. I'm a blood bought, saved, King James, Bible believer, justified, redeemed uh, child of God. The last thing I want to do is go speak evil of other people. I'm going to try with all of my might and all of my power to refrain my tongue from speaking evil and guile. Guile is deceit. I don't want to deceive you. And uh, I don't want to talk bad about other people, put them down and name calls and, and, and just say horrible things about them. That's the last thing I want to do. Recently I saw another video by somebody uh, that they made a video against me on YouTube and it was only a couple minutes long so I go, well, it's really short. I guess I'll watch it. And it's not so much what the person said against me, although they called me, uh, let me remember, knucklehead. <laughs> I don't remember being called that one before. But, oh, wow, what a great person. Is that, is that refraining your tongue from evil and your lip from speaking guile, calling somebody a knucklehead? No, no, you're not a King James Bible believer. You may claim to be, but you're not obeying the Scripture. But I looked at that and I thought, what, what is the reason for this video? And... <sighs> It wasn't so much the words, it was the attitude. The attitude was, Robert Breaker, ha ha ha, he said such and such, nah nah nah. And it's just, I, I just go back to second grade. And I get so tired, so tired of the way people act. Let me show you something. I found this the other day, actually my mom had it in Oklahoma. And I said, you know what I want to do? <laughs> this might be silly, this might be funny, but I got to do it. My mom found my diploma from kindergarten. This is my kindergarten diploma, Robert Breaker, Master of Kinder Arts and Skills. You didn't know I had my master's degree. I got it when I graduated kindergarten. 1980, June 2nd, 1980, Miss Barbara Olson. There's my kindergarten diploma. And I said to myself, you know what I want to do in one of these videos? <laughs> I want to show people my kindergarten diploma and say, I just want everybody to know that I've graduated from kindergarten and I don't want to go back there. One of the things that I remember most about kindergarten was when we go out on the playground and play. And all these kids, many of them from lost backgrounds, I was in a, a, a state-run secular school, public school as a kid, 
That's where I learned bad stuff, unfortunately. That's where I heard bad words for the first time from these kids in school. And these kids would go out and they'd play on the playground and in kindergarten. Your mama's so fat that she's a blah, blah, blah. And, and just the, the, the kids would just make fun and attack. No, uh you are. No, you are. No, you are. And, and I just remember being in kindergarten and just seeing people call each other names all the time. And that's something I don't want to do. So, I just want you to know, I graduated from kindergarten. I'm not going to go back there. Amen? <laughs> I want to be the kind of Christian that the Bible says I'm supposed to be. That is a Christian who has honor, verse 7, and compassion, who's full of pity and courteous and love, who does not render evil for evil like a kindergartner would do, and uh, who refrains their tongue from evil, and from speaking guile. So I want to do that to the best of my ability. And uh, so far, I believe I've done the best I could. I think there's been one or two times where I had to do a video um, talking about someone. Because, like I've always said, I don't want to talk about the man. I want to talk about the issue. I want to talk about the doctrine that they bring up. Let's don't talk about them. Let's talk about, oh, here's the issue brought up. All right, let's deal with the issue, not with the man. But I think there's been a couple times I had to deal with the man because the man was the issue. And one of those was Billy Graham. And Billy Graham is a big name preacher in America and even the world. And a lot of people to this day think Billy Graham was a great person. And if you look at Billy Graham, he's one of the biggest apostates that ever lived. He helped to bring in much apostasy into uh, Christian circles. And he mixed religions together. And I don't have time to get into it, but if you want to see it, go to YouTube, look up uh, The Truth About Billy Graham. And I was greatly hurt by seeing the truth about Billy Graham and some of the things that he taught and said. And how he, he said, I mean, he even said, I believe that uh, Muslims, although they don't understand it, are part of the body of Christ. You look at that and you go, that is an outright heresy. That is not, like the Bible says, of one mind. That's not true. And he said he didn't believe that hell was a literal lake of fire. And he said other things. And you just look at that and you go, uh-uh, no. But yet, here's the issue. I hear people all the time claiming to be Christians. How great is Billy Graham? Oh, what a wonderful person. And I go, have you ever really studied out the person? He used to have his crusades. And when we started, he, he first started, he preached 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. I've met people that said they truly got saved going to a Billy Graham crusade because they heard the gospel and they believed it. But as he got older, he would go into a city and he would do his crusades and he would have a a Methodist, he'd have an Episcopalian, he'd have a Catholic priest. And he'd say, now come up here, and uh, whatever you identify with, we'll have them come down and talk with you. I'm sorry, but Catholicism is not biblical. I'm not a Roman Catholic, nor do I want to have anything to do with Catholicism, because they don't preach the Scripture. They preach doctrine foreign to the Scriptures. They teach tradition rather than the Word of God. So that's just one example. But I don't want to be someone who's railing on someone, talking bad about them. If you do watch that video, you'll see I did my absolute best to be nice. I didn't call names. I just said, let's look at the facts. Was this man preaching the gospel correctly? Or was this man trying to mix Catholicism into Protestantism? Wasn't he trying to bring in a new world government system? You know, that man knew every president. Why didn't he give him the gospel? Why didn't he tell him how to get saved? I mean, if you were a friend of the president, why couldn't you say, hey, president, can you give me one, one hour, <laughs> just one hour to address the nation? Boy, I'd fill them up with the blood of Christ. I'd be preaching on the blood of Jesus and how to be saved. Why didn't Billy Graham ever mention the blood? If he did, it was always, oh, Jesus shed his blood. But it was never trust in the blood atonement of Jesus Christ, Romans 3.25. So I don't want to speak bad about other people. So I don't mention people and call them names and rail against them. I want to deal with the issue. Well, that man was the issue. Now, it says here in verse 11, Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. So here's what we as Christians are supposed to do. We're supposed to eschew evil. Now, the word eschew means turn aside from or turn away from. So when it comes to evil, we as Christians should go, Nope, I'm not going there. Well, I don't want to go there. I don't want to be a railer. I don't want to be someone who's evil and speaking evil and saying bad things about others. I don't want to do that. Um, I intentionally really waited until Billy Graham died because I didn't want to hurt the guy or anything like that. But many people were asking me, is Billy Graham good? 
is Billy Graham, it's, was he a great Christian? Was he the kind of person that we should try to be? And I said, no. My whole ministry, my whole life actually, I heard from the pulpit many preachers saying, Billy Graham is a compromiser. Billy Graham is deceiving people. Billy Graham has changed from what he used to preach to preach something else. And it's a watered down version of the gospel. So I wanted you to know, the Bible does say to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. See, a lot of people like to quote, reprove, rebuke, and exhort, and they love doing that. But they don't like the long suffering and the doctrine parts. They don't have any long suffering. All they want to do is rail on others and things like that. So we that are Christians, we should want to do good. Let's go to Ephesians 2, 8, real quick. And uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, we know what it says. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, some of the best verses in the entire Bible, how we're saved by faith, not by works. Ephesians 2, 8 says, For by grace you are saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we're not saved by our works. We're saved by faith alone. But now look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created into Christ Jesus, unto what? Unto good works, which God hath before and ordained that we should walk in them. So we're not saved by our works. No way. But when we are saved... The intention that God had was, now that you're saved, I'd really like you to do some good works. I'd really like you to do good rather than evil. So go back to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter 3, look what it says in verse 10. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from what? Evil. And his lips that they speak no guile. So who is he speaking to? Christians. And he's saying, hey... If you're a Christian, don't say evil and don't do evil. Hate evil and do everything you can as a Christian to get away from evil. Verse 11, let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. So, eschew evil. That means depart from, turn away from, get away from evil. All right, what is evil? Well, he just told us in verse 10, speaking about somebody else, that you, saying horrible, mean things, putting them down, railing on them, uh, saying lies about them, deceiving others about them, saying things that aren't true about them, that's evil. Now, yeah, you can tell the truth about someone, and if someone is wrong, you should be, they, you should be warned about that person. We should always warn others, hey, this guy is wrong. I get emails all the time, Brother Breaker, what about this guy? What about this guy? Half the time, well, actually most of the time, I don't know who they're talking about. And unfortunately, I don't have time to watch all the videos and find out if that person's good or not. So I always tell people, practice discernment. Look to see if that person is teaching Paul, King James Bible, and the blood atonement of Christ for salvation. And if they're not, then get away from them. Because they're not teaching what the Bible says we're supposed to teach. But um, the Bible says we're supposed to eschew evil, get away from it. Let's go to Second. Timothy, all right? This is not just peculiar to Peter. As we've been going through this Bible study, we've been seeing time again, time again, time again, that many of the things that Peter is saying are found in the epistles of Paul as well, showing us that the early Christians all got in the same mind and the same mindset, and most of it was they accepted the doctrine that was revealed to Paul by Jesus, and that's why two-thirds of the New Testament is all about Paul. If you take how many chapters in the book of Acts is about Paul and add that to the epistles of Paul, you find out that two-thirds of the New Testament is all about the Apostle Paul. So Paul's in the Bible for a reason. 2 Timothy 2.19, look what, what Paul tells us about iniquity, about sin, and how we should eschew it, how we should get away from evil. 2 Timothy 2.19 Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. All right, who names the name of Christ? Well, if we're saved, we're saved uh, through the blood. Of who? Of who? Jesus. Of the Christ. The Christ who shed his blood for us. And so if we're saved, we should depart from iniquity. should depart from evil. We should do our best not to sin. Now, I say that because... I'm, and, and let me say this, I'm not saying that we're saved by works, okay? <laughs> Lest someone try to take what I'm saying out of context, I'm not saying that. But I am saying after we're saved by faith alone, not works, then what God wants from us is to do our absolute best to live a holy, righteous, separated, sanctified life. And do everything we can to depart from sin, iniquity, evil, get away from it. Let's go to Romans chapter 6 and verse 12. See another verse by Paul. 
Romans 6, 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So, if the Bible's true, and I believe every word of it, then the last thing that I need to do as a Christian is to use my YouTube channel as a place to come and talk bad and speak evil and rail on other Christians. Because that's evil. I just showed you the verses where, where old Peter says, speak evil of no man. And we're supposed to do what? Eschew evil. Turn away from it. Get away from it. Don't badmouth and talk bad about other Christians. That are, even if they're doing right or wrong. And sometimes they do wrong. Well, if a guy's doing wrong, what are we supposed to have? Compassion. All right, we see another Christian out there teaching something they shouldn't. Maybe they have a false doctrine. Or other than make a YouTube video go, well, that knuckle-headed, pug-nosed, cross-eyed moron, fool, that jerk, that jack leg, that, that moron, well, I tell you what that fool needs, he needs this. Well, that pop, 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 and just browbeat him. All we're doing is turning that guy off to the truth. Here's what you ought to do. Brothers and sisters, I'm coming to you today. Um, my heart is grieved for this other brother in Christ who is not teaching true doctrine. He's departed from the truth. And I want to make this video today not to talk bad about him or put him down, but to uh, hopefully reach him. This video is for him. I hope he watches it. And uh, ask him, come with me to these verses. Let me show you. You're teaching this, but here's what the Bible says. And I want you to know that I'm praying for you, and I love you. What's the Bible say? Love the brethren. And uh, I, I, I'm, I'm doing this in the, in the right spirit, and I don't want to attack you or put you down. I'm coming to you with a, with a spirit of meekness and humility and asking you, please rethink your doctrine, and please get right with God, because what you're preaching is not. Do you see the difference? <laughs> Some people don't. Some people think that a Christian is supposed to go and attack other Christians and call them names and put them down and browbeat them and beat them up. And you're not going to win a brother in Christ like that. The way to win people is to say, look, I really do care about you. And I really do want to see you get this doctrine correct. And I want to see you preaching and teaching what the Bible says. Let me go to a couple more verses. 1 Corinthians 15. Why do I say that? Well, because we're in this chapter in 1 Peter where it says it. But also, the reason I say that is because who's the sinner? Alright, let's say a guy is a YouTube channel preacher and now he's in sin. And now he's preaching a false doctrine. Alright, he's wrong. If I come over and then I just start lamb blasting him and putting him down and calling him names, now I'm the sinner. Now I'm wrong. My daddy used to always tell me, two wrongs don't make a right. So why would I do wrong in order to try to reach the man that's doing wrong? Shouldn't I be above all that? Shouldn't I, you know, flash my diploma from kindergarten? Shouldn't I man up? Shouldn't I be what the Bible says and say, hey, look, I'm not going to stoop down to your level. I'm not going to be that guy. I'm going to come to you in love and in meekness and in charity and in long-suffering and in grace. And I'm going to say, look, I love you in the Lord and I want you to get right. And here's what you need to do. You're teaching this or you're doing this in your life and it's a sin. I care about you. If you keep down that way, you're going to end up in destruction. You're going to end up in problems. You're going to end up in, in, in sickness. You're going to have diseases. You're going to lose your wife. Or you're going to lose your kids. Or you're going to, and try to help. That's what we as Christians are supposed to do, help other Christians. Get away from sin. Don't be a sinner yourself. Do the best you can to not sin. Now, yes, when we're saved, we still sin. I hate it, but we do. And I'm going to show you a verse on that here in a minute. But that's the body of sin that sins. Inside of the believer is the new creature. And the new creature is sinless because it's God's Holy Spirit inside of our spirit, and He's got our soul. And that soul is the purchased possession. It belongs to God. So it can't sin, but the body can sin. And so the Christian life is a fight against the flesh. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 34. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Now what's he talking about? Well, don't be deceived. Look at verse 33. Look at verse 33. Let's look at the context. 
Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. What are we that are Christians supposed to have? Good manners. Do you have good manners? Uh, I get emails all the time from people going, Brother Breaker, I used to watch this guy on YouTube, or that guy on YouTube, or this guy on YouTube, and they claim to be King James Bible believers. I can't watch them anymore. I just can't take it. And I say, well, what are they saying that, that, that bothers you? All they're doing is calling people names and ridiculing and putting down and laughing at and mocking other Christians. They don't have good manners. <laughs> I go, well, they haven't read the Bible. Evil communications corrupt good manners. So they are sinning against God and the book that they claim to believe. And yet they think they're right with God and that you're wrong when you come to them and go, I'm just trying to tell you that the Bible says you shouldn't act that way. Shut up, Robert Breaker! Who do you think you are, you heretic, you fool, you moron? It's like, I'm nobody. <laughs> I'm just a sinner saved by grace. But I can read. And the Bible says evil communications corrupts good manners. So why do you have to be evil? Why do you have to be wicked? Why do you have to name call? Why do you have to put down other Christians? Why do you have to be so mean? You don't have to be. And that's not what you should be. You should sin not. Verse 34. Now let's go to Ephesians 4. So I wasn't planning to speak on this. I mean, I really don't have anybody in particular in my mind that I'm thinking about as I'm teaching this. But it is sad to see people claiming to be Christians, and yet they're mean, they're hateful, they've got a critical spirit, they're prideful, they're, they're angry, they're, they're just so awful that you just don't want to be around them. And that's the one thing that I'm hearing the most from other Christians is, Brother Breaker, I used to watch so-and-so on YouTube. I can't stand it anymore because he just got such a critical spirit. I watch you because you try to present and edify and give the truth without name-calling and attacking and putting down and, and being mean. Look what it says here in verse 26. Ephesians 4, 20. Actually, let's back up. Verse 20. Well, let's back way up. Amen. <laughs> let's look, go to verse 20. Ephesians 4, 20. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts okay that's who you were before you were saved don't be like that and be renewed in the, renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which after god is created in righteousness and true holiness verse 25 wherefore putting away lying speak every man truth with his neighbor for we are members one of another don't lie about other christians boy i tell you there are a lot of lies on youtube about me from people that claim to be King James Bible believers. And I just look at that and go, man, I'd hate to be in their shoes at the judgment seat of Christ. They're going to be losing a lot of rewards because they're not obeying the book by lying and saying things about other Christians that aren't true. But look at verse 26. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now look at the verse 27. Neither give place to the devil. The context is speaking evil and lying about other people. If you do that as a Christian and you lie about other people, guess what you're doing? You're giving place to the devil. And the devil's right behind you going, Ooh, I can't wait to get in there. And I've seen that lately a lot. How Christians talking bad about other Christians can not only destroy the life of the person they're talking about, but also can destroy their lives as well. And also somebody over overhearing, listening will come away believing something that's not true about somebody. A lot of times children overhear what their parents talk about. I remember one preacher one time talking about, never talk about what happens at church on Sunday in front of your kids. And uh, he's met many, many children that were raised in, in church that aren't even saved. And he says, how come you're not saved? And he says, well, we go to church and all I could hear coming back from church is mommy and daddy talking about, oh, that pastor was an idiot. He said this, that moron, that, blah, blah. And they said, why should I go to church and listen to a guy if they go and they don't even like what he says and they're making fun of him, talking bad about him? And I was like, whoa. wonder how many parents have damned their children to hell by talking bad about other Christians, bad-mouthing them. And now the kids say, I don't want to be saved because even my parents say that the very people that they want me to listen to are hypocrites. I don't want to be a hypocrite. See how that gives place to the devil, speaking evil and talking bad about other people. So the Bible clearly tells us not to do evil. And there's a lot of things you can do that are evil with your body. But a lot of evil comes from your mouth, from your heart, and it comes out. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. 
just go to John real quick, see what he says. First, First John 2, 1 says, My little children, these things I write unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Well, Romans 3, 25, whom God sent forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. So thank God that, that he's the propitiation, it's through his blood that we're saved. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses from all sin. But because we're saved and cleansed from all sins, isn't it an excuse to go out and sin the more? <laughs> I, I've never understood how a person can be a Christian and say, I'm saved so I can go sin now because I'm not going to hell. I've never thought that way. I never, that never entered my head. When I got saved, I didn't go, Woohoo, now I can go live like the devil. I never thought that. I thought, man, I'm saved now. Jesus died in my place for my sins. I'm saved. You know what I want to do? I want to tell people about Jesus so they'll be saved too. I want people to get saved and get what I got. Well, the problem is we're still in the flesh until the rapture. And so the Bible says we're supposed to walk in the spirit that we fulfill not the lust of the flesh. So go to Romans chapter 7 and verse 15. Here's Paul. Okay? Here's Paul. Now, here's what I've been trying to tell you for many years, and, and I've talked about it a lot is Lordship Salvation. And I get a friend from South Carolina calling from time to time talking about this as well. And South Carolina just seems to be a hotbed of Lordship Salvation for some reason. But there are people out there that preach Lordship Salvation. And they say, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. So they say, if you're sinning, then you were never saved to begin with. And you go, no, that's, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you can get saved through the blood of Jesus, trusting in his shed blood, and then you can go out and do dumb things and you can go sin. But you shouldn't. You shouldn't. You're supposed to eschew sin, which means get away from it. And you are supposed to depart from sin. That's what Paul and Peter tell us. So as Christians, we should do everything within our power to not sin. And it seems like over and over and over and over and over and over and over the most mentioned sin by both Peter and Paul and all the others was the sin of using your tongue for saying something you shouldn't. Why does that seem like the biggest sin? Evil speaking. But that seems to be the biggest sin that the early church dealt with is Christians going around saying things they shouldn't say. And it's just horrible. So, the question is, can you be a Christian and sin? Well, the Lordship Salvation says, no, if you ever sin, then you weren't saved to begin with. Well, then Apostle Paul must be in hell right now, if that's your doctrine. The Bible teaches you can be saved and you can sin. You can speak evil of other people, but you shouldn't. So the Bible doesn't give you an excuse to sin. See my video on YouTube, Grace, not an excuse to sin. I don't believe that salvation is an excuse for us to go do evil. I believe that after we're saved, we're supposed to do right because Jesus wants us to. And out of love, we serve him and we do our best to live for him. But let me read this quickly. This is Paul talking about the fight. Because there is a struggle. There is a battle. And the battle is between our flesh and our spirit. And the Bible says we're supposed to walk in the spirit. That we fulfill not the lust of the flesh. But a lot of Christians, they don't walk in the Spirit, they walk in the flesh. And that's why they say bad things. It's because they're carnal. And the Bible tells us what that is. It's called being carnal. So there's a lot of carnal Christians out there, and it's a shame. Look at uh, Romans chapter 7, and Paul talking about this battle, this spiritual battle that he had to deal with his entire life. Starting there in verse uh, 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that doeth it, but sin that dwelleth in me. What is he saying? He's saying, in my flesh, my flesh is sinful. And my flesh desires to do wrong. And sometimes I let my flesh get away from me and do what it wants. Sometimes I let my tongue get away from me and say something it shouldn't. <laughs> But that's not what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to fight the flesh and walk in the Spirit. And he continues there in verse uh, 17. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. 
For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that doeth it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Sin is in our flesh, and we still have that battle until the day we die or until the rapture comes, because we haven't received our glorified body yet. That's why I'm looking forward to the rapture, because that's when I get a glorified body, and then I'll never be able to sin again. Whew. Can't wait for that day. And then he continues there in verse 21. I find then a law that when I do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. That's this. But I see another law in my members, warring. That's the war. It's a spiritual fight. It's a warfare. It's the Christian's war. Always bite your tongue. Always fight against the flesh. Don't do things that you shouldn't do. Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So the Christian life is a battle. Okay, let's go back to 1 Peter. It's a real fight, and sometimes it's hard. Sometimes we get so in the flesh that we don't want to serve God. We don't want to go to church. We don't want to do this. We don't want to do that, you know? We don't want to go watch videos on YouTube and learn the Bible. We don't want to do, you know, all these things we don't want to do. We just want to follow the flesh and just go, no, 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 I'm done. I don't want to do this or do that. And that's, that's awful. We should want to serve God. Now, verse, 1 Peter chapter 3, in 1 Peter chapter 3, I told you that the context of verse 1 all the way down to verse 7 is marriage. So that means, really, we can apply verse 8, 9, 10, and 11 to marriage as well. And marriage is really a battle, if you think about it. Because what is marriage? In marriage, you have the husband and you have the wife. And what is each one of those? Body, soul, spirit, body, soul, spirit. A wife has her flesh and a husband has his sinful flesh. And so they're both sinners. So the Bible says two become one and now you're one flesh in God's eyes when you're married. So now you got two fleshes instead of one that are sinful. <laughs> so you know what that makes marriage? Marriage is a big old battle sometimes. Because what happens if the man gets in the flesh and then the woman gets in the flesh? Whoo, boy. I've heard stories of men that are married to women that are just a handful. That are Christians and they claim to be Christians, but then they're married to a woman who's just a horrible and screams and hollers and shouts and he's like, I'm just trying to live for the Lord. Shut up! and they're fighting. So we look at the context of 1 Peter chapter 3. Context is marriage. But we see him kind of stop talking about marriage and starting on verse 8 saying, Now everybody, all of you, but be ye all of one mind and be like this. So we can apply verse 8, 9, 10, and 11 to marriage as well, but it also applies to everybody. Don't sin. Do everything you can as a Christian to stop sinning. Be pitiful courteous, loving, caring, and do everything you can to fight the flesh. And if you ever get married, if you're a man looking for a wife, you know what I recommend? Find the most spiritual Christian woman that you can, so that if you ever are in the flesh, she can help you, lift you up in the spirit. And vice versa. If you're looking for a husband, try to find the most spiritual Christian man that you can. Otherwise, two fleshes uh, we'll fight each other. Oh, it'll be horrible. There, there's Marriage is wonderful, but marriage is what you make of it. Let's go to Ecclesiastes 4. And I'm, So I, I really wanted to do the best I could to explain chapter 3 and the context, starting out with marriage, but then how these last verses can relate to marriage, but also can be kind of taken out of context in a way, because he says, finally, this, the, and it, it can apply to everybody. Now let's go to Ecclesiastes. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, that's why I recommend people get married. It's a good thing to be married if you can find a good wife, if you're a man, or if you're a woman, a good husband. But we're living in the last days where it's getting harder and harder and harder to find somebody who's a real Christian and who's good and godly. And if you get married to the wrong one, you're going to have problems, and it's going to be hard. 
And I don't wish that on anybody. A bad marriage can be just hell on earth. So it's so important. People ask me all the time. They call me up. But Brother Breaker, I'm not married. I'm a man or I'm a woman. I'm looking for someone and I'm praying and asking God. I say, just don't be in a hurry. Say, Lord, please send me the one that you'd have me to have. Because I want a strong marriage. I want us both walking in the Spirit and doing our best to live for God. Because you won't be happy unless your marriage is good. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Yeah, two can be better than one. If you're both serving the Lord, you get rewards in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to them that is, him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up again. Help him again. Again, if two lie together, then they can have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. You say, where's a threefold cord? The husband, the wife, and then God. God. The husband and the wife. If the wife is looking up to God and trying to serve him, then she'll serve her husband. If the husband's looking up to God and trying to uh, sacrifice for his wife, then you've got a threefold cord going right there. And it's not quickly broken. But what happens if the wife gets her eyes on herself instead of her husband? Oh, the cord's broken. She's not serving the Lord. She's in the flesh. Oh, no. What if the man does? Oh, no. He's in. No, let's all serve God together. And then God can use us better. So I went into that to talk about that because the context of 1 Peter chapter 3 is marriage. So I wanted to end there about marriage. So all we got down to was verse 11. Let's see if we can get a little bit farther and uh, go to verse 12 at least. So verse 11. 1 Peter 3 verse 11 says, Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Well, in marriage one thing that you want is peace. And when you have a godly wife, or if you have a godly husband, then it's, it's a peaceful marriage, and it's rest, and it's good. But if you're both in the flesh, oh, you're walking on eggshells, and that's not a healthy way to live, to be stressed out all the time. So try your best to be the kind of person that the Bible says you're supposed to be, and then you'll have a healthy marriage. Now, verse 12, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the faith of the Lord is against them that do evil. Now, how do you like that verse? That verse is literally saying that if you're living right and living for God and doing your best to quit sinning, then he'll be more quick to listen to you and answer your prayers. But if you're living in sin and you're walking more in the flesh, God in heaven will be like, uh, nah, nah you, not until you get right. Now, if you get right with me, then, then I might answer your prayer. But if you're not living right, you're not doing right, eh. Now, the Bible says when we're saved, we can go boldly before the throne of grace and talk to God through the blood of Jesus. He hears us. But God sees us when we're saved, and there's some times that if we're backslidden and we're living wrong, we're doing wrong, that God is upset with us. Let me show you this in Hebrews real quick. So as a Christian, we should live right. You see, when you're saved, you cannot lose your salvation, all right? But what can you lose? You can lose rewards in heaven. And you can lose having your prayers answered. And we read that in, in uh, 1 Peter. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. You see, when we're saved, we're sons of God. Look at verse 5. For ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint with thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you're saved and you're living for God and you're doing everything you can to depart from evil, well, life will be a lot easier. God said, I'll answer your, your prayer quicker. <laughs> but if you're not, ooh, then God can scourge you. You know, God has quite a big whip. And uh, he, can, he can make you go through some things. And that's what we see here later on in the context. Let's go back to 1 Peter. And I hate to get ahead of myself, but... But look at what it says here in verse, oh, look at verse uh, 17. Verse 17, For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil doing. If you're going to have to suffer in this life, and that's what this life is, it's a veil of tears, it's a life of suffering, 
Isn't it better to suffer because you did right than to suffer for having done something stupid and done wrong in the flesh? So if you're a Christian and you're living in the flesh and you're carnal and you're doing evil, life will be harder. And you won't have a good conscience. And you'll uh, not sleep well at night. But if you're living for the Lord, well, the Bible says, Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We're all going to suffer in this life. But if I'm going to suffer, I want it to be because I did right, not because I chose to do wrong. Does that make sense? That's what I'm trying to get to there. <laughs> So back to verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. This is from Proverbs 15.3. He's quoting the book of Proverbs. So let's go back to Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 3, and let's read it. Remember when we went through Hebrews, and we saw how Paul was the author of Hebrews, and how in Hebrews he's always going back to Psalms and other places. Well, Peter knew his Bible as well. So Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. Well, how about that? Now, let's read the context. Verse 1, soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Should we get in the flesh as Christians and say horrible, grievous, bad things about others to stir up anger? No, that would be incarnal. That would be carnality. That would be being in the flesh. No, we shouldn't do that. We should watch our tongues and keep our tongues from evil speaking. Because otherwise, we stir up strife. And that's not something we should do. Right? <laughs> right. Look at verse 2. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. Oh, well, that reminds me of what Peter says here. That in verse 10, refrain his tongue from evil. Over here, he says in Proverbs, uh, watch what you say with your tongue, otherwise you're going to be called by God a fool and foolish. Now that's not Robert Breaker calling you a fool. That's God in heaven saying, look, you are being foolish and you're actually a fool if you're using your tongue to talk bad about other Christians. <laughs> I don't believe in calling people names. But God is God. He can do what He wants. So God can call you a name. And if the shoe fits, buddy, wear it. If you're out there just living your life just to use it for evil, to speak bad about other Christians, God says you're a fool. And I feel sorry for you. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Look at verse 4. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. It's about the spirit versus the flesh. And it's about today, Christianity. If you're a Christian, walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. Because if you're in the flesh, you're a fool, the Bible says. And then it says you're perverse. Perverse means unclean or dirty. Perverse. We get the word pervert from this. <laughs> if you're not doing what's righteous and just, then you're perverted. You're a pervert if you're using your tongue just to talk bad about other Christians. That's, that's crazy, but that's... Look at verse 5. A fool despiseth his father's instruction. Well, there you go. That Hebrews. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth every son whom he receives. We're saved. We're sons of God. God wants you to be a son that does everything within their power to live right, to please their daddy. Otherwise, you're a fool. And whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Verse 5. A fool despiseth his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. In the house of the righteous is much treasure, but in the revenues of the wicked is trouble. Verse 7, the lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the foolish doeth not so. It's amazing to me how often in the book of Proverbs, over and over and over, it's all about don't say something with your mouth. Don't speak bad. Don't. There's out of your heart, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life, it says in Proverbs. Don't use your tongue for evil. Verse 7, the lips of the wise disperse knowledge. I'm trying to teach you and show you what the Bible says. I want to edify. I don't want to put down. I don't want to attack. I want to be wise. Why? Because wisdom is from the Bible. I'm just simply trying to be what God told me to be, and I'm reading the Bible, and the Bible's telling me, get away from sin, get away from evil, eschew it, and don't say bad things about other people. Verse 8, 
The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he loveth him that falleth after righteousness. Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. Whoa. Now, that's a good place to stop. Because we're almost we're a little over an hour. But do you see what he says? He that hateth reproof shall die. What I have done today is bring you a reproof. Try to correct you if you're wrong. If you're one of those that is just using their tongue to speak evil about other people, then you've got problems. And the Bible says if you won't receive this reproof, this, this sermon that I've given you today, you just might die. Now go back to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. For he that will love life and see good days... Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Do you see that right there? He that will love life and see good days. It's inferred if all you do is you live to go around and talk bad about other people, you just might not live a long life and see good days. You just might die because you're a critical-spirited, mean, hateful person. You're full of bitterness and anger, and that's not good. And is God in favor of that? And you? No. Verse 12, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Alright? What kind of a Christian are you? One who's doing everything they can to be a Christian, who's trying to get away from sin, and is trying to do good and do right? Are you evil? I want to do good. I want to be one of these walking in the Spirit. And according to what the Bible says, I need to control my tongue, not call people names, not render evil for evil or railing for railing. I need to have compassion, pity, courteousness, love, and all these things. Do everything I can, verse 11, um, to seek peace and ensue it. And that's what I want to do. So there's <laughs> how far do we get today. <laughs> We've got one verse, verse 12. So hopefully next time we'll finish up starting in verse 13 all the way down to verse 22. And uh, that's my desire, hopefully, to finish up next time. I hope this is a blessing. And I really don't know what else to do but just tell you and warn you, don't be someone who's in the flesh speaking evil of others. You might not live as long as you could have because you're in rebellion against God. And he just might take you home early. I'd hate to see that. Every one of us has a great opportunity to serve God, and we could live a long life, and we could be happy living for God if we do it God's way rather than our own. All right, I'll stop there. We'll see you next time. God bless. Bye-bye.